if you go repeating the disclaimer for Bob's benefit, I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Not just me. Right. So different areas of law. So there's lots of different areas of law. Um, I'm going to be talking about four particular areas that tend to impact upon free software projects. These are the areas of law that if you're the, a project leader or you're uh, contributing to a project, that you should have some at least passing familiarity with, some vague notion of what it is. So the first one, and this is related to the, the talk I gave in the, the previous lecture, which is copyright, which basically says who can distribute, modify, who can do what with a piece of software, with a work. Right? We just call it a work in, in law terms. Um, patents. Uh, patents are government granted monopolies on ideas. Okay, very different to copyright. Right? So a patent is a way of getting a monopoly on a particular idea or a particular methodology and no one else can use that idea, that methodology without getting your permission. And uh, that then means that you can charge money to give that permission if you want to. Or you can just deny that, that uh, permission completely. And so we'll talk quite a bit about patents. Patents have mostly a negative impact on free software projects. But they're quite important because learning to avoid patents can be quite important. Trade secrets. Trade secrets is stuff that people want to keep secret. And so if you have trade secrets, you might claim that your source code is a trade secret. Well, if you publish that source code up on a website somewhere, uh, then it's no longer a trade secret. Right? So a trade secret is something that you uh, deliberately try to keep secret and um, that's what things like non-disclosure agreements are for. If somebody's asking you to sign a piece of paper saying you won't disclose something, then it's probably because they consider that something that they are about to tell you to be a trade secret. Okay? And a trademark is names that are owned. Names or logos or symbols that are owned by somebody. So if you want to use that name or that logo or that symbol in the same field of endeavour, that's quite an important little distinction, um, then if you want to use it in the same field of endeavour, for example in computing or in software, then you have to get permission from the trademark holder. Now each of these areas of law has quite different rules associated with it, very, very different rules associated with it. And that leads us on to this little gem here, intellectual property. Often hear people talking about intellectual property in general, saying, um, I am reserving all my intellectual property rights, or I don't have the IP rights in this, something like that. Now, the problem with that terminology, intellectual property, is that it basically joins together all of these four areas and treats them as a single whole. But each of these four areas are, in fact, extremely different, right? So. It means that if you're treating them as a whole, you may be confusing them in some way and making generalisations that don't apply to the individual ones. For that reason, there are some people in the free software community who are uh, very adamant that you should never use the term intellectual property and only ever refer specifically to those individual areas. And um, particular Richard Stallman is, is very, very particular about that. Um, and the reason is that he doesn't want people to be confused about the, the separation of these four different areas of law. Okay? But you do see some people in the free software community still referring to intellectual property. You just need to remember that when you see the term, that what they're saying may apply to just some of these areas. It may not apply to all of these areas. It might usually only apply to one of these areas of law. Okay. So, derived work. This is the key concept in copyright law. You have to understand what a derived work is. Now, this is the formal definition, the formal, formal US legal definition of derivative work. The definition of derivative work is extremely similar in other countries. Um, although the case law surrounding derivative work, which determines exactly where the boundaries are, can vary country by country. But the basic concept is very, very similar. Let's have a look at this definition and it'll hopefully be, be clear from that. A derivative work is a work based upon one or more pre-existing works such as a translation, musical arrangement, dramatization, fictionalization, motion picture version, sound recording, etc, etc, that um, 
uh, transform redacted, a work consisting of editorial revisions, annotations, elaborations, or other modifications, which as a whole represent an original work of authorship is a derivative work. So when you have one work and you create a new work which is based upon the earlier work, right, uses material from the earlier work, for example, then the new work is a derivative work of the earlier work. So why does derivative work, why does that definition matter? Because you don't want to ignore the base. Yeah, you don't want to ignore the base, yes. In particular, copyright applies to derivative works. So if something is a derivative work, if you create a new work, and your new work is a derivative work of an existing work, then you have to respect whatever license conditions the original work was under. If your new work is not a derivative work of this previous work, if it's completely all your own work, you started from scratch, right? then that means that you don't have to obey any other licensing conditions from other people. You get to choose the license yourself. Hopefully you'll choose a sensible license and one of the existing free software licenses if you're trying to produce free software, but you aren't required to choose a particular one. You aren't required to obey somebody else's license. So knowing whether your work is derived from a previous person's work can be very important. Now, um, the question as to whether something is a derived work does lead to a lot of discussions in the free software world. Uh, for example, if you have a program, say Firefox, right, you've used the Firefox web browser, and you add a plugin, right, if somebody writes a plugin which adds extra functionality to Firefox, is that plugin a derived work of Firefox? And you can argue it either way. You can say, well, the plugin doesn't contain any of the code of Firefox, it's just made to work with it, it's not a derived work. But you could also argue, hang on, it's dependent upon Firefox. The plugin is useless without Firefox. So the functionality of the plugin is only enabled through the existence of Firefox. Maybe it is a drive work. All right, these are the sorts of things that lawyers get into arguments about. You really need to err on the side of caution. If you are producing a new work and you are in doubt, you should really assume that it is a derived work and you should obey the license, assume you have to obey the license conditions of the previous work. Right? That's the safe course of action. Okay? Has, has anybody tested that, let's say, the scenario of a plugin for Firefox as a, de as a derivative or not yes. a derivative? Yes. Has that been tested in court in a software context? That type of thing has been tested, and I believe it's gone down both ways, depending on which court decision. Right. Um, but the safe thing to do is assume it is a derived work. Mm. Yeah. Now, some people use rule of thumb. It's very common. Um, in the software space to have rules of thumb on whether something is a derived work or not. A rule of thumb is just a rough <coughs> layman's guide. Okay? And one of the rule of thumbs that's often used is does the new work link to the old work? Is it linked in as part of the same program? And you assume that if it is linked in, it is a derived work. And conversely, if it's not linked in, then it's not a derived work. Now, that rule will work most of the time, maybe 80% of the time. But there are significant uh, times when it doesn't work. How about, the, that? How about the plugin? Uh, it is possible. Uh, the, the classic example that's usually used in the free software community is a Linux kernel module. Right? On, this, on this box here, um, I'm running a Linux kernel. So I'm running version 2.6.27-11 of the Linux kernel. And I have a whole lot of modules loaded that add additional functionality. Some of it quite basic functionality, like the ability to use my network card, or the ability to talk to my disk, right? or use a file system or whatever. This is basic functionality that is provided by a module. Okay. Then the question is, is the module a derived work of the kernel? If, if, it, if the provider of the plugin can make the plugin fit into some other browser as well, Ah, very well done. That's, that's extremely perceptive of you. If the work can, could also be used in another framework, and it is functional in that other framework, like a different browser, right, then that provides some evidence that it may not be a derived work. You can't be 100% sure, but it is more likely that a court would think it's not a derived work if it's standalone. One of the other tests is whether it pre-existed. For example, if you had a plugin for Linux, that was a module that provided a file system, a new file system. 
And that file system, you originally wrote that module for some other operating system, say BSD or Minix. And then you ported it to make it work in Linux, right? Then that usually you would argue that that module is not a drive work of Linux. It was originally written for BSD. It might be a drive work of BSD, but it's probably not a drive work of Linux, right? Because it already existed working on another platform. Okay? But when you created the new version of the module that worked on Linux, you might have modified the module to make it especially work for Linux. That might mean it's now a drive work both of BSD and Linux. Okay? So it is possible to create a Linux kernel module, for example, that is not a drive work of the Linux kernel. You could create a valid Linux kernel module that does nothing. It's just an empty.ko file that will be loaded, right, but doesn't actually do anything. And that would probably not be a derived work under, under most, in most courts. But nearly every module does have some intimate relationship with the kernel. Right? Nearly all of these kernel modules on my system do, in fact, hook deeply into the kernel. And so most of these, the general consensus is that kernel modules are nearly always derived works, which means they do have to obey the licensing conditions of the Linux kernel. And the same with plugins for things like Firefox. But there are exceptions. And sometimes those exceptions can be quite important. But if you're relying upon that exception, you better consult a real lawyer and not just believe, not just listen to me. Okay? And you need to, in fact, you probably want to consult more than one lawyer and an experienced lawyer who deals with copyright and derived work issues. And you might even have to look at multiple jurisdictions. Because if you're trying to walk a fine line on derived work, you're on dangerous ground because somebody can sue you if you're not obeying their license, right? Generally, the safe thing is to assume that if it in any way touches the other work or builds upon another work, assume it's a drive work and assume you have to obey those license conditions. And if it really doesn't suit you, make sure you get good legal advice. Okay, so back to derived work. Um, so there's this question whether a plugin module is a drive work. That is something that has been tested in court, and I believe it's gone both ways in different situations, but in general, you should assume that it is. Okay, copyright policies. So copyright policies are one of the main ways that a free software project interacts with the law, because the free software project has to decide what their policy shall be for copyright, uh, dealing with copyright in their piece of software. And what's the main decision they have to make? It's not even listed on this slide because it's so obvious. What's the main decision you have to make in a free software project regarding copyright? No, no something simpler. We talked about it in the last lecture. Which license are you going to? What license are you going to use? What copyright license you are going to choose? Right, or multiple copyright licenses possibly. That's the most basic <coughs> decision that a free software project has to make. But then there are some additional decisions that can be made. Right? Now, not all projects make these decisions explicitly, but some of them do. For example, some projects require copyright assignment. That means that before they will accept code into the project, so you're the project leader for a new project, and you decide that you won't accept any code into the project unless somebody signs a piece of paper and faxes it to you or mails it to you, saying that they assign copyright in the change, right, their patch, to you, okay? And you have to have a formal legal transfer of copyright. It has to have some very, very particular words saying that it transfers copyright to the project or to a, some other individual. Now, why would a project do that? Why do you think a project would require that anyone contributing to the project sign over copyright? And why wouldn't they do it? Okay. In, in this lab here, Right, you were sending patches between each other, right? Imagine if every time you send a patch, you had to sign a piece of paper with a real pen, fax it to the other person to say, yes, you may incorporate that patch. What would that do to the whole free software process? Big layer of administration. A lot of layer of administration, which results in... Much slower turnaround, that's right. It would slow down the development process, right? And also it would result in something else. Room full of paper and less developers. A lot of people working on free software are doing it because it's fun. They want to do it, but they don't want to be signing legal paperwork and consulting with lawyers to contribute to a project. 
So they just get turned off and go away and never contribute anything. You won't even know that they were interested. Isn't right? The that can happen. Is this the mechanism that Apache uses? The Apache a lot of projects use this. The GNU project uses this. Um, Apache has some copyright assignment, but I, I think they have a lighter weight one than the GNU one. I'm not, I'm not sure, though. So I have actually contributed to the Apache. I thought the first Apache. time you contribute to the music, you sign over yeah, stuff to the Apache. Yeah, that's usually what happens. Yeah. The first contribution, you sign a piece of paper, and every time you change job as well, you've got to do it. They've got to re-sign right. it. Because often your employer has to sign saying that they are allowing you to make contributions on company time. Um, so very commonly, both the employer and the employee and the individual has to sign the copyright assignment notice. And usually it covers not just that individual patch, but all future patches you contribute to the same project. Mm -hmm. right? That's, that reduces the paperwork slightly, but it still has an administrative friction effect, a legal friction um, effect, and it still reduces the number of contributors you get. Right? Sometimes quite considerably, depending on the project. Particularly if something lightweight like a game. Um, you're not going to get many contributors to some fun project like a game if you require a whole lot of paperwork every time that uh, you have a contribution. So why do some projects require it? Why do some, despite the, all these disadvantages I've outlined, why do some projects say you have to do it? One of them might be because they want to release it under two different licenses, such as the Open Office one, they require you to um, sign it over to some. Right. Indeed, they may want to be able to change the license in the future. The project might want to be able to release it under some different license in the future, and you can only change the license if you're the copyright holder. So all of the copyright holders, all the individual contributors, would have to agree. But if you have copyright assignment to the central organisation, then that central organisation owns the complete copyright on the entire project, and the steering committee for that, that project would then decide to change the license in the future. Why else might they do it? What's another reason? People might leave, uh, I mean, if it's dependent on one person, for all this chance, as you said, like, they may go overseas. Uh, like, mm -hmm. You work. might change organization, but there's a, there's a more fundamental one than that. It's, it's, a, it's a covering your asses type one, right? Where uh, you're afraid that lawyers might do something. Warranty. Right? Well, say I make a contribution to some project, Right? Then in the future, I might you know, go crazy and hire a lawyer and claim to that organisation, I didn't really intend for you to be able to use that. I was just showing you the patch because I thought it was a nice patch, but I didn't really mean to give you permission to use it. Right? And I'll sue them. I'll sue the pants off them and claim you know, all, of the, all of the money that they've got from selling the software for nothing. I'll have that in the future, please. Um, or if they've actually been selling it commercially, you know, try and claim some percentage of it or all of it or stop them from shipping, right? This type of thing has happened. Companies, when they get desperate, do desperate things. And some companies have tried to claim that free software projects have used their work without permissions. So because of these idiots who've done this, excuse my language, because of these people who've done this in the past, that is the reason why some projects now require this copyright assignment so that they have a piece of signed paper they can put in front of the court and say, look, he signed his name saying that he was allowing this contribution to go ahead. How, right? does, it pan, how does it pan out if, um, for example, you sign over your contribution to Apache yep. and say, here is my work, take yep. it, use it, yep. but you pinched it from SCO's ah, kernel. Right, so right. It was never your work, okay. but you represent it. I believe it depends upon the jurisdiction, but it may be that me, who, uh, who I might be the one who's in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Or it might be that Apache is in trouble, That's depending on the jurisdiction. Yeah. I think it can happen both ways, or right. we might both be in trouble. Right. Um, usually the one who's got the deeper pockets is the one who ends up in trouble, because <laughs> they're the ones that end up being sued, because you sue people who've got money, mm. right? That's how things work, yeah. okay? So Apache in this case doesn't actually have a lot of money, but probably it end up being some company that's using Apache yeah. that end up being sued. So we've had examples of car manufacturers who happen to be using a bit of free software who get sued by another company, and the car manufacturer didn't contribute to the software, right? But just because they're using it, they're being sued on the claim that some other third party contributed some patch to this software in some previous year. And this poor car manufacturer then has to go and uh, defend themselves in court. That has happened, right? The lawsuit is available. If you look on uh, groklaw.net, you can see an example of that actually happening. Okay, so actually a car parts manufacturer, I think it was, rather than a car manufacturer, Auto Zone. Okay, so... Um, Can I talk about Grockmore? 
rock lore. Yeah, I'm t I've got uh, rock lore actually in my belayer things, but it's yeah, it's worth, worth mentioning now probably. Rocklaw.net is a website. Also, it's really a blog, but it's a legal blog run by somebody called Pamela Jones, usually known as PJ. And PJ is a or was um, uh, what's called a paralegal, which means like a legal assistant. And um, she's particularly good at explaining legal concepts. And she's also very good at talking to lawyers and getting them to explain legal concepts. And she has a website, rocklaw.net, which is extremely popular among people who are studying what's happening with the law and free software. It's a very worthwhile site, a lot of very good contributions. Um, she closely follows a lot of the lawsuits that are going on. There's constantly lawsuits going on related to free software in one way or another. And uh, her website is the best source of information on those lawsuits. Okay. So, some projects try and solve this problem using a signed off system. And you've seen that, we asked you to do a signed off by in the patches that you sent to, the, uh, to each other in that last uh, project. Now I'm going to show you what you were signing. All right? um, you were agreeing to something, and it wasn't you giving up your firstborn. Um, you were agreeing to a particular statement. Um, the documentation within the Linux kernel documentation and there is a statement that <coughs> describes let me just look for signed off by Let's see here it is submitting patches and let's bring that up all right okay so when you uh, put signed off by what you are agreeing to is this developer's certificate of origin. By making a contribution to this project, I certify that the contribution was created in whole or in part by me and I have the right to submit it under an open source license indicated in the file, etc. Okay, so that's the shorthand signed off by that is shorthand for this. Now when the trouble came up with the SCO lawsuit, there was a lot of debate among lawyers as to what they were going to do. There was some thought that that all contributions to the Linux kernel would require that the contributors sign a copyright assignment statement like is done for many other projects. The problem with that, as we've already uh, discussed, that caused a lot of legal friction that would have slowed down Linux kernel development a lot and it would have caused some people just to not contribute anymore. So what was needed was a compromise, something which the lawyers thought probably would be enforceable, right, but which had the minimum legal friction. And somebody came up with the idea of this signed off by system and in the documentation of the kernel it now explains that when you submit a patch to the Linux kernel and you put signed off by, you are agreeing to the following conditions. And it's basically saying that yes, you have the right to contribute that work. Okay? So it's like a little, um, it's, a, it's a copyright agreement that you, you are asserting that you have the appropriate permissions. Right, so that's a, a much lighter weight solution. And it's now being adopted by many other projects as well. It was a really pioneering thing in the area of FOSS and the law. And uh, it's now being used by lots of other projects, although some other projects that use it are missing a piece of it in that they're missing this statement in their documentation, which means the signed off by has less of a legal standing because it doesn't actually say precisely what it means for that project. Right? So projects that you signed off by really should have that statement in their documentation somewhere, their development documentation. Okay, which reminds me we need to put it into Samba. <laughs> um, so, so this uh, implies agreement to the developer certificate uh, of origin, and um, adoption of this sign off system came as a result of this particular SCO lawsuit um, that you can read about all at droplaw.net, and we'll be talking about a bit more in later lectures. Some projects require a non -corp corporate copyright. This is a rather unusual one, actually, but I'm mentioning it because of the um, the use of it by the Samba project, which I've been heavily involved with. And so we require that anyone contributing to Samba provide personal copyright, not corporate copyright. So if you work for some company like Hewlett Packard and you make a contribution to Samba, you have to make the contribution as the individual you rather than as Hewlett Packard. So the copyright has to be held by the individual. Can anyone think why we did that? It's like being sued by an individual? Close, but, but not quite. It's part of this legal history. We were hit by a case where um, a company in the US 
took Samba, claimed they wrote it, which they didn't, and started trying to sell it uh, commercially. And um, when we pointed out, hang on, we wrote that, they tried to um, use an area of US law which basically said that um, the penalty for them stealing our work was zero. And it's because of this strange thing called copyright registration in the United States. Um, if a work is of US origin, then in order to get all the protections of copyright, if somebody violates your copyright, you have the ability to go and sue them, right? To prevent them from violating the copyright in future. But under, U under US law, if you don't register your copyright, which means paying some money to the Library of Congress, if you don't pay that, that fee, then you only get to claim what's called actual damages, right? And actual damages for free software is zero. Right? So this company basically worked out this scam where they could violate the GPL on Samba and say that you know, they, they um, uh, could do it with impunity because even if we took them to court and won the court case, the penalty would be zero. Okay? So they couldn't lose. Right? So we didn't like this, particularly we didn't like the aspect that that particular rule in US law only applies to US works. Now Samba was written here in the Department of Computer Science right, by an Australian. So, it's not a US work, you would think. Aha! Uh -huh. But their tricky lawyers claimed it is a US work because it was released onto the internet, and the internet is US. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is self-contradictory. The fact that it was released in Australia on the internet shows the US internet isn't US. But our lawyers said that, well, some judges might have bought that argument. Some judges might have agreed to that. Right? There's enough dumb judges out there, excuse me, uh, enough dumb judges out there that they might have, somebody might have agreed to that. So we had to try and solve this problem. So we had to register our copyright. When we tried to register our copyright, the Library of Congress decided to treat us like a book, not like software. They thought we were very similar to publishing a book, right? And the Library of Congress, when you publish a book, you have to register every version of your book separately and pay the fee each time you have a new edition of the book that came out. We were doing daily releases, right? We had to pay the Library of Congress every day to register our copyright. Okay, now our lawyers then talked to the Library of Congress and said, please have mercy on these poor little individual developers that are just trying to release this free software. And the Library of Congress lawyers said, well, okay, if it really is just individual developers, we'll let you get away with it. But if there's any companies involved, no, you pay every version, right? So we had a new policy saying, individual developers contributing to Samba in order to register our copyright to prevent this scam artist from being able to rip off Samba. It's very strange, very strange history. There's also some other reasons as well, which I go into. If you have a look on the development page, develop.samba.org, it goes through the full legal history and there's three or four other legal events that led to this. But this is the sort of thing you meet in free software, right? This is, I'm the legal officer for the uh, Samba project and I deal with these sort of legal issues all the time. That's the sort of thing that comes up. Particularly if your software is at all popular and it is of commercial value, somebody somewhere will try and exploit it against your wishes and they'll find some obscure area of law where they can try and claim that they can do so with impunity. And then you need a lawyer on your side. Luckily, we have had a very, very good lawyer called Evan Boblin, who also is the legal counsel for Richard Stallman at the Free Software Foundation, who has offered his services for free uh, for the past 15 years or so to the Samba team. And it's been excellent, the advice that we've received. So my apologies, Evan, if you're watching this for any of the misinformation I'm giving on the uh, uh, free software and the law. Well, what was the scam that this company was going to do? Because, I mean, you know, any of they us... They approached a, a number of Unix vendors, right. and they approached those Unix vendors, and those Unix vendors were interested in offering an SMB server, but they were scared of the GPL. Ah. So this company offered them an SMB server that they wrote themselves. Right. Right? And this, they got a whole lot of fees in advance from these Unix companies to the tunes of millions of dollars, right? Um, and as far as we can tell, their business plan was to grab those fees and then flee the country. Right. Um, anyway, so um, we weren't all together happy about this, and as you might imagine. And uh, when we, we, one of these Unix vendors, well, we'll remain nameless, but one of these Unix vendors, um, I individually worked for that company, um, he sent us a uh, CD-ROM of the release of this, this uh, product, this supposedly proprietary product, 
and we had a look at it, and it actually still had embedded in some of the binaries copyright Andrew Tridgell. Um, <laughs> they hadn't quite managed to remove all the copyright, they removed most, most of them, but they missed some. You'd think that'd be an easy one to grip for? You would think it would be, and in fact, we, there's a long history. I can, over a coffee sometime, I'll tell you the complete history. It's, it's rather hilarious, the whole thing. So they're amazingly inept, this company. Uh, anyway, that's fine. Let's move on a little bit. So, um, so some projects require this sign-up process. Uh, we've got that curious legal one with Samba. Not, some, some other projects require this as well, non-corporate copyright, but not many. Um, and some require, require a sign-up process. Google uses this a little bit for some of their projects, where you sign up in a web form, and you type in, instead of a signature, you type, I agree in all caps, and click a button, right? Now, I don't know whether that's legally enforceable or not, but, you know, maybe it is. I have to assume it is. Um, and so that's used for some projects on um, uh, Google and some other companies use that. These policies can, however, backfire um, because normally under the copy left in the GPL, when you make an, a, an enhancement to a project like SAMP or any other free software project, you have to then contribute those enhancements back to the project. You're required to. And that's how free software really grows and, and, uh, and thrives by requiring people to make enhancements to it to contribute it back. Well, what happens if somebody uh, makes a contribution but refuses to agree to one of these conditions? Right? That way, they can say, yes, we are contributing back under the GPL, but we refuse to sign that bit of paper. They might do that as a way to avoid the contribution going back into the project. Why would they do that? This has happened to us, right, again. Uh, a large Unix vendor, a large two-letter Unix vendor, um, uh, did this. They, they made contributions to Samba, and they were using Samba as part of a commercial product, and they didn't want the contributions to become part of the standard version of Samba because they wanted their version of Samba to be better so people would buy their version of Unix that came with their version of Samba. So they deliberately refused to agree to the personal copyright assignment in order to avoid their, um, to, to ensure that we wouldn't accept their patch. So that it didn't end up going into Samba, which meant they could have their own private version and they wouldn't be competing with anyone else. But they could still receive all the changes from everyone else so that they wouldn't have to give back a one-way gain. And they thought that was great for them. And their product is now defunct. Um, that sort of thing tends to backfire on the companies eventually. Uh, because people just ignore them after a while. Anyway, that's fine. That, that has happened to us. Lots of things have happened to the Samba project over the years. Strange things like this. Okay, so patents. Patents are a monopoly on an idea. And it's rather strange, really. Um, it actually started out, I believe, in something like 18th century England, where there was uh, monopolies on something like importing wheat or you know, exporting... Uh, wool, that sort of thing, and you've got a patent which was like a monopoly on a particular type of trade, but it morphed over the years into monopolies on ideas, and uh, it's since then morphed into, you can actually apply monopolies on software, which is close enough to a mathematical type context. Originally patents weren't allowed on mathematics, but eventually through some um, legal uh, manoeuvring by various companies, patents were allowed for a while on software. And there's still debate as to whether they are allowed on software. Some jurisdictions say they're not allowed on software. For example, in Europe, generally patents aren't allowed on software, except if you actually look in Europe, you'll find there are hundreds of thousands of patents on software, and yet they're not allowed. Hang on, isn't that a problem? This is the law, right? That's how the law tends to work. It's all rather strange. And there's lots of websites that discuss the situation of patents, software patents in Europe, and it's all rather strange. So, um, what, so a patent might be something like an algorithm. For example, you might have, um, you all know the JPEG uh, file format. You've seen JPEG images, right, turn up on the web, okay? Somebody might have, for example, a patent on the algorithm, the mathematics involved in compressing a JPEG or decompressing it to display it, right? In that case, nobody else can write a piece of software that compresses a JPEG unless they have to do one of two things. They either have to license the patent, get permission from the patent holder to use that technique, or they have to not infringe the patent, which means they have to implement, get the same result by using a different sequence of steps. 
using a different bit of mathematics, different area of mathematics, to get the same result. That second option is often missed in people in understanding patterns. Non-infringement is usually what free software projects should aim for. You basically, if you want to implement something that somebody has patented, what you should try and aim to do is find a different set of steps that achieves the same goal. Because if it's a different set of steps, then it won't infringe the patent. Right? And you should confirm that with a patent attorney. Uh, how do you find a patent attorney? Well, if you're very rich, you can pay one. If you're less rich, you can contact one of the organisations that I list at the end of this talk, where you can talk to uh, lawyers who will provide free service to free software um, developers. There are quite a number of lawyers who will provide free legal assistance to free software projects. Okay? So, this quote is very relevant. This is a quote from Bill Gates from 1991. Now, I should say, Bill, Microsoft is now one of the biggest holders of patents uh, in the world. Not quite the biggest, but one of the largest. And this quote was from Bill Gates. If people had understood how patents would be granted when most of today's ideas were invented and had taken out patents, the industry would be at a complete standstill today. Right? It's basically saying that patents could kill the IT industry. And patents are desperately trying to kill the IT industry now, um, 18 years later. Patents are causing major problems. And it's because you can get patents on, on some seemingly very, very obvious ideas. And there is one core problem with patents. That core problem is that independent invention is not a defense. So if you come up with a patent, and you register that patent and pay the appropriate fees, which are quite high, it's quite expensive to register a patent. If you register that patent, then somebody else has never seen your patent. He can prove completely that he had no possibility of ever seeing that patent. He was living on another planet at the time, and the, the hyperwave communications were down for the whole period. Right? There are ways you can prove, by the way, you didn't have access to a patent. Um, so if you can absolutely prove you had no access to the patent, and you came up with the same idea, doesn't matter. You're still infringing. That means your own ideas, if somebody else happens to have written in a document somewhere that they own that idea, your own ideas are potentially owned by them. Right? And that's where the real danger lies because patents can be held on very, very obvious ideas. Extremely obvious ideas. And independent invention isn't unusual, it's the norm. In software, other engineers independently inventing the same solution to the same problem is normal. That's what software engineers do. When presented with the same set of uh, task, the same problem, they often invent much the same solution. But the first person could patent it, then everyone else then owes them. And they might even owe them retrospectively. You might put out a product, five years later you discover there was a patent on it, you might then owe uh, royalties for the past five years. It could put you out of business. And it has put many companies out of business. Okay, so that's the problem with patents. Right? So we need to learn how to deal with them in the free software world. Um, why? Yeah, so question. That means patents. It means first come, first serve? Yeah. Almost, yes. There's some strange rules. Um, in fact, it's first come, minus one year served. Um, you can in fact claim, there's a thing called a priority date on a patent, which is basically the date that is used to determine whether something predates the patent or not. When you file for the patent, you can claim a priority date for around a year beforehand. It can be up to two years in some circumstances. So you can actually claim a patent at an earlier date than when you file it. Which means you can actually, somebody else might have been infringing your patent for the last year who hadn't even filed it yet, and the next year you can claim royalties for that previous year. So ideally you can uh, file on stuff uh, with a claim date before you thought of it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Happens all the time, right? There's also all sorts of other tricks you can do with patents, right? All sorts of nasty tricks. Um, so why are patents a problem? Well, first of all, could the FOSS community have a whole lot of patents? Well, that's not a problem. We don't have a lot of revenue coming in for most free software projects, and patents are expensive to gain, they're expensive to maintain, they're expensive to fight. Right? Fighting a patent lawsuit can cost you millions just to get started. Um, Many software patents are very trivial but dangerous. They cover quite trivial uses of um, algorithms, um, but they might cover a whole lot of software. And um, some people have been quoted as saying that it's almost impossible to write a computer program these days without violating somebody's patent. 
right? And it might well be true. It's hard to say whether it is true or not. Um, independent invention is not an offence. That's extremely important, and it's often not, um, not hit upon when people are discussing patents. If you independently come up with the idea, that basically means you didn't steal the idea from them. That is not a defence. You are still guilty. Finally, it's impossible to license a patent for use in FOSS in most cases. Not all cases, but it's very, very difficult to license a patent for use in free software. And that's because most patent licenses are royalties per user, per seat licenses, per copy licenses. So if I'm the patent holder, I say something like, yes, you may use this idea in your software, as long as you pay me one dollar for everyone that uses your software. Why is that a problem for free software? You don't know who's using the software. You don't know who's using it. The distribution model of free software is that anyone can download it and give it to anyone else. Right? You'd have to have some way of counting exactly who's using it. Every time you handed a copy to somebody else, you'd have to send an email with a dollar, right? Well, physical mail maybe, with a dollar back to the holder of that patent and the hundreds of other patents that it might infringe. Real problems. So the best thing to do in free software is to avoid the patents. Try to not infringe upon them if at all possible. There have been some historical cases where free software has managed to license patents. Uh, I've been involved with some of those, and but the, the best known one is uh, Red Hat was sued, the Red Hat software that makes Red Hat Linux, was sued over a patent infringement um, by, I've forgotten the name of the company that sued them, it was just a few months ago. And um, that company wanted them to pay up, uh, pay up for a patent license. And what Red Hat did was they negotiated with the company, and they negotiated a patent license where Yes, Red Hat had to pay, but they bought a license for everyone. Unlimited numbers of users. Anyone could use the idea in free software. Right? That's okay. That works with free software because you don't have to count the individual users. But if it requires a per seat royalty or a per user royalty or anything that involves counting or individual payments or individual signatures, it just what doesn't work with free software. The whole free software model would break down if that was required. You can imagine every time that you guys went to use one of these machines, we had to, we had to count you know, and send off some money. That would be a real pain. Drive up the cost of the course too. Okay, so that's patents. Um, there are some efforts to defend against patents in free software. There's something called the Open Invention Network. And that has created a patent pool. Can anyone guess what a patent pool is? A shared collection of patents. A shared collection of patents, that's right. So it's where companies pledge their patents into their patent pool, and these patents are then available to anyone producing free software, right? But, but only if they're producing free software. And if any one of the people who is a member of that open innovation network gets sued over patent infringement, then the OIN can use that entire patent portfolio to counter sue. Right? So it's got hundreds of patents in it, and that covers a lot of software. So if some company comes along and sues one of the members and says, you're infringing on our patent, pay up, the OIM can go back and say, you're infringing on 200 of our patents, pay up even more. Right? So that's the way they defend, a countersuit. Okay? This sort of thing tends to happen, usually happens behind closed doors. Occasionally it comes out to the open. One of these came out to the open just quite recently. Uh, if you look on Grok Law, you can see some announcements about it. But most of these things tend to happen behind closed doors. Um, the sign of a good lawyer, by the way, is that they tend not to get into the news much. They're so successful, they don't tend to get much advertising. Um, so the best lawyers in the free software world are often the ones that aren't very well known. Anyway, um, peer to patent. Peer to patent is a technique for analysing patents where the patent office in the United States makes draft patents available for people to inspect, analyse and criticise the hope is to improve the quality of patents so that less trivial and stupid patents get granted. Okay, and it's quite a worthwhile initiative, uh, but it's also quite time consuming, laborious. Defensive publications are another one where you can publish a document documenting the idea without grabbing a patent. You don't pay for a patent, you just publish prominently. Um, there's, there's various sites where you can do this in a prominent fashion. Um, you publish the, the, the concept to demonstrate that you had the idea first. And in theory, if somebody else comes along and tries to patent that idea, they won't be able to because there's something called prior art. 
And the patent office, in theory, will look at this um, def these defensive publications and say, well, somebody else has already had that idea. It's not original. Because patents are only supposed to be granted on original ideas. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the patent office is not renowned for their high quality search capabilities for searching for things like this. Okay, PubPat um, is an organisation, the uh, public patent organisation, that is trying to fix the patent system, fix many of the deficiencies, and there's a lot more deficiencies than what I've gone through in these few minutes. And if you go to pubpat.org, their website, they go through a lot more of the deficiencies. And there's a very good video of a talk by Dan Ravisher, um, the head of the PubPat organisation, where he gave us a Google talk a while ago, and he goes through some of the issues with patents and explains patents in very, very clearly in great detail. Very worthwhile talk if you're interested in patents. Uh, so PubPat tries to challenge some particular patents, tries to take them down one at a time by challenging them, by trying to prove that the idea that the patent did not meet the criteria that the patent office is supposed to make them meet. For example, claiming that it wasn't original. Proving that somebody else had the idea beforehand. And so um, I've been involved in some of those things, not with PubPat, but with other searches where you basically search old archives, particularly Usenet archives are very useful. Early Usenet archives, and you demonstrate that somebody on Usenet discussed that idea more than, say, two years before the patent was filed, and that may help to invalidate the patent. It's a difficult thing to do. It's not easy. Often in discussions on mailing lists in the free software world, people just assume, oh, there's prior art, problem's over. Prior art is just the beginning. There's a long legal process to use the prior art to actually invalidate a patent. It's a difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and somewhat hairy process, dangerous in the sense that if, it, if you don't, if you're not successful, the, the conclusion can be that you actually strengthen the patent by trying to attack it. Uh, because there's some strange uh, laws relating to patents and patent challenges that so can actually cause it to be strengthened. Okay, license terms. Um, Many FOSS licenses have patent defence clauses. So they have a clause in them that, for example, might say that if you, you, if you distribute this software, or you modify this software, or you contribute to this software, then you are automatically granting a license on all the patents related to this software to everyone who receives the software. Right? So if some company uses the GCC compiler, and they distribute the GCC compiler in particular, and they have a, a patent on some compiler technique, by distributing the GCC compiler, they are automatically licensing that patent to everyone. Okay, the GPL, both version two and version three, has clauses like that. The clauses in version two had some potential loopholes. They weren't written quite carefully enough, and Microsoft discovered one of those loopholes and then used that loophole against the free software community in a rather famous case. Uh, Novell Microsoft Agreement, you can look it up. And one of the main things the GPL version 3 did was to um, plug that loophole to try to ensure that um, if somebody uh, distributed a piece of software that in fact it uh, would um, result in them licensing any patents related to that software. Okay? So uh, there's other terms in there, there's, there's some fine nuances on the patent terms in GPL v2 and v3 that I haven't gone through, but uh, are also quite important. And there's various discussion forums where you can read up about this if you want all the details. Trademarks. Um, trademarks are an exclusive right to a name or a logo, and they're usually tied to a product type, so into a field of endeavour. For example, you might have the trademark on the word Samba for software, but that doesn't mean that you can prevent people going and dancing. Right, because the samba is also a Brazilian dance, but it's a different field of endeavour. One is dancing, the other is software. So the two, the, if there were two trademarks, they wouldn't conflict with each other because they're different fields of endeavour. Okay. Now we don't have the trademark on the word samba, right? Um, for the samba software, we deliberately chose not to. Um, anyway, I'll explain that as well in a minute. So um, trademarks are unusual in all of these areas of law because they must be actively defended, or it can be lost. And that's why you see companies always, if you say something like, you casually say, oh, um, have a, you know, have a Kleenex, right? And the Kleenex, you know, see Kleenex tissues? Okay, have a Kleenex. And um, you're actually handing them a different brand, but you're calling um, the tissue generically a Kleenex. 
whereas that is a particular brand with a trademark, right? Then Kleenex, the company that, that owns the trademark for Kleenex, I've forgotten who it is, you know, Johnson & Johnson or something, I don't know who it is. Anyway, they have to go and actively try and prevent you from doing that. They have to defend the trademark and make sure it's only used for their particular product. Otherwise, eventually, somebody will be able to claim that their trademark has been diluted and lost. It disappears. All right? And that's why you sometimes get cease and desist letters. You use some terminology on your blog, and you get a letter from a lawyer saying, please do not use that terminology. That terminology is trademarked by so-and-so. Okay? I've received one of those letters for Samba. Before it was called Samba, it was called SMB Server. Right? Before that, it was called NB Server. Before that, it was called Server. I keep, never decide what the name should be. Anyway, I called it SMB Server at one stage, and there was a company that had a trademark on the name SMB Server. They also made an SMB server. Samba is an SMB server, right? So I just called it SMB server. I didn't know there was a trademark. So this company that had the trademark wrote to me a legal letter saying, we have the trademark in the name SMB server, please cease using it immediately. Don't use that name. So I changed the name. I looked in the dictionary and looked for a name that had the same letters in it, came up with Samba instead, right? A few years later, when their product was basically dead, they wrote to me again and said, we really regret sending that first letter because Sam is a much better name. Um, so anyway, trademarks, you know, trademark enforcement can actually be a negative thing. So it's quite funny to get that from the, the same people at the company. Uh, Sam book, you know, is now widely used and their product isn't. Okay, so um, should a FOSS project register a trademark? Well, what is the, do you think the advantages and disadvantages of a free software project registering a trademark? advantage is that it prevents somebody else from using the exact same uh, identifying mark and yes. potentially corrupting it. Or misusing the mark in particular. Yes. Okay. What's the disadvantage of registering a trademark? It's even up on the board. <laughs> You've got to defend it. You've got to defend it. Otherwise you lose it. Okay. Now, it's actually quite expensive to continue defending it. You've got to put some effort into defending it all the time. Right? There is the most famous case of, of trademark problems around the um, GNU Linux distributions is the trademark on Linux itself. Linux was becoming quite popular in the mid-90s. And so, of course, when something becomes popular and something becomes valuable, there'll be some scam artist out there who's trying to make money out of it. So, somebody who was completely unrelated to the Linux community, had never made any contributions at all, right, decided to trademark the name Linux for operating systems. He decided to claim the trademark. The trademark office said, yeah, sure, nobody else has got it. There you go, have the trademark. He then wrote to anyone using Linux, anyone selling Linux or selling books on Linux, and said, you owe me money. It was a way of printing money. Millions of people were using it. Everyone owed him money suddenly. Right? So there was a big trademark. Uh, there was a lawsuit, not a particularly big lawsuit. And... Um, Eventually, this person was uh, convinced to go away under the threat of hordes of lawyers, and um, his claim was debunked uh, because he made false claims in the fact that he'd been using it as unique and he invented this name, etc., in, in registering his trademark, trademark. And eventually, the trademark was transferred to somebody more appropriate. Guess who? Linus. Linus Torvalds, right? Who actually started the Linux kernel. So he ended up with the trademark. And that's why at the bottom of many, many Linux sites, you will see Linux is a trademark of Linus Torvalds. Why do you think it says that at the bottom of all the sites? Because they'll lose the trademark again if they don't keep defending it. Which means now they've got it, they've got to put that everywhere, everyone's got to use that. Now, Linus offers very generous trademark terms. He says basically anyone could use it who is using it for Linux. Right? Uh, but and he says you don't have to pay anything to use it, which is great, right? Uh, in most, most cases. There's, there's a, a thing called the Linux International that has the stewardship for that trademark, and they have various conditions and things. So if you go and have a look at the Linux International website, then you can see exactly what they do with the Linux trademark. Um, but it is in some ways a shame, because it means there's more administrative overhead. So instead of getting on with writing software, some, somebody out there has to care about this legal issue. And it's, it's all because this scam art has tried to uh, make everyone pay for the name Linux. Okay, these things happen. Right, so there's a Linux trademark and uh, help of the Linux Foundation. The distribution trademarks, like Red Hat has a trademark on their name, Red Hat. 
And there's interesting problems for derived distributions, like CentOS, which is ex almost exactly the same as Red Hat, just with a different name. They have to make sure that when they create CentOS, they remove anything that says Red Hat inside it, because Red Hat has a trademark. Right? They don't grant the, the permission to use that trademark at anything except their own products. The Mozilla Firefox trademark, I discussed that a little bit the other day about Ice Weasel and things. You remember, I did talk about that the other day. So you know a bit about that trademark. And finally, the OSI open source trademark, which is not on the word, words open source, it's on the logo, the open source logo. And uh, that's one of the better known trademarks in the new Linux community. Okay, another area of law that is important is end user license agreements. How many of you have clicked OK to a license agreement and installed a bit of software? Right? How many of you read what you were clicking OK to? Read the license before clicking? Once or twice. Right? Okay. So some of you may well have signed over all of your future children or your, you know, your grandparents into slavery. You don't know. You could have been signing anything. Right? You just clicked OK. Right? It's very tempting, I know, when there's sort of dozens of them and they're hundreds of pages long or whatever length they are. It's, a, it's very tempting to speak OK. When you're a free software developer, you have to be careful because there are some clauses in the EULAs that are toxic to free software developers. For example, you might install a piece of software and it might say you may not use this software um, in order to develop free software. So you can't use this compiler, you can't use this library, you can't use it in, in some way. Right? And even if your, what you create is completely independent, the fact that you'd utilise their software in the process of creating it means you might violate their licence. Potentially down the track, they might come down and come after you and say, we own all that software because you violated our licence. That would be pretty nasty. Right? So it's worth checking in the EULA whether there's anything nasty like that. And there are some pretty nasty ones out there. Um, so, uh, particularly if you're in an area that, I mean, Samba is in this area, we have to be very careful of EULAs and some software, particularly on Windows. Um, but uh, most free software developers are just install and run on free software. So Ubuntu doesn't have any nasty EULAs, right? So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you're installing some proprietary software package, it's worth reading through the license just to make sure you're not doing, handing over anything that's really valuable to you. Um, common types of problems that are in EULAs, it might have anti-reverse engineering terms. So it might say, for example, you're not allowed to try and work out how the software works by decompiling it and looking inside it. Right? And if you do, then if you, anything you create as a result of that, they might end up owning, for example. Okay? So you've got to be careful that if you're doing anything related to reverse engineering or creating similar software, then you're not in, uh, infringing upon EULA terms and user license agreement terms. Some software has non-compete terms. The most famous one is the BitMover license. I mentioned BitKeeper the other day. Um, the BitKeeper, Bit, the company that made BitKeeper is called BitMover, and they had a license with a non-compete term that basically says, if you use this software, you may not work on any other um, uh, source code management system, you may not contribute to it. So that's a non-compete type term in an EULA. And some EULAs have operating system or hardware ties. This is particularly problematic for virtualization. For example, one of you who was interested in working on Wine, who was going to be working on Wine? The Wine project. Yeah. Okay. So if you're using Wine, sometimes when you install a piece of software, the EULA says you may not use this software except on the following operating system, and you may not use it in a virtualization environment. Right? You can only use it on a real CPU. They're trying to get the right licensing fees out to you. If you want to run it on a virtualization environment, you have to pay extra. Right? So some software, that can affect wine development in some cases if you're trying to get a particular package to work. So it's worth checking the EULAs before you install any proprietary software on top of wine. And with virtualization, the same thing. That's become quite common lately. It's because of the way the, the, the fees are charged for some uh, piece of software where they charge per CPU. Uh, they might charge $100 per CPU to use the software. I mean, how many CPUs are there in a virtual machine? It sort of head scratches for a while, it'd be hard to work it out. And so they just say, ah, you can't use it on virtual machines. Right? Or, or you have to pay extra to use it on a virtual machine. Okay, license enforcement. If you, you have a license, you've got released a piece of free software, and you think that somebody is violating your license, what do you do? Okay, what would you do? So, 
you know, one of you have written a piece of free software, you, you write a small patch you sent to the other people, right, in this lab. Okay? So you sent a patch to Carl, right? And you thought that Carl was violating your license. He wasn't obeying the GPL or whatever you chose on that patch. What do you do? You go and beat him up. He's just on the other side of the room. That's pretty easy. That's right. You can beat him up easily. Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you think you'd do? Contact him and ask what he's doing. Yeah. Ask contact him in, a, in an aggressive fashion, threatening lawsuits, or contact him in a friendly fashion? A friendly and positive way. Friendly and positive way. That's right. It's very important. Most... Most of the time, or a pretty large portion of the time, the, um, the infringement is accidental. A lot of the time it's just because they just thought, oh, it's free software, nobody cares what we do with it. Right? In fact, you may care. The author of the software might really care about the GPL, might care about the license release number. So what you need to do is you need to find out who's responsible for the product and send them a friendly letter or email. If they don't answer to the friendly letter or email, what I usually do is I ring them up. And I ring up the front desk and say, hi, I'd like to talk to the product manager for the following product. And I get shunted around half a dozen and eventually I get some engineer and I say, hi, I'm the author of this bit of software. I've noticed that you're using your, uh, my software as part of your product. I'm delighted to see you're using it, but are you aware that you do need to follow the conditions of the Guru General Public License? And he sort of tends to stammer and sort of wonder what's going on and, oh, no, I wasn't aware of that, you know, what do I need to do? And you start talking through them and explaining, and things all you know, work out fine, usually. Sometimes it doesn't work out fine. If, you get, if the phone call gets transferred to a lawyer, then probably it's not going to work out fine. <laughs> right? And that's happened as well. Okay? In that case, you need to sometimes involve your own lawyer, and at that point, things can get tricky. But um, luckily, as I mentioned, there are legal resources available to free software developers, and they're very good lawyers. And as yet, we haven't lost a case. Um, so all the time we've been able to convince people to go and do the right thing because we have the law on our side. Um, it is in fact very difficult to um, get away with violating free software licences if the, if the author of the program wants to take the trouble to pursue it. And mostly doing the right thing isn't that onerous for them. That's right. It's usually very, very simple. They just need to put a little bit in their documentation saying that it's under the GPL and they need to offer a tarball up on their website containing a, a copy of the software. Very, very simple, usually costs almost nothing to do, so in fact usually they're willing to comply, but sometimes they're not willing to comply. At that time you, you might have to sort of persuade them a little bit, at that time you might have to send, get a lawyer to send a letter. How yep. do the um, free software lawyers make their money? Um, they receive donations from large corporations that are interested in the, um, the, the free software will thrive. So there's quite a few companies that make considerable donations to, for example, the Software Freedom Law Centre. Some of them do it as pro bono. Within the legal profession, there's this concept of pro bono, which is basically free service. And it is strongly encouraged as a matter of professional ethics, professional pride, that lawyers put a certain percentage of their time into pro bono efforts. But there are also ethical guidelines within legal organisations as to what constitutes pro bono effort. You can't just go and help out your neighbour with something, or you can't just go and you know help your mum solve her divorce or whatever, right? Um, it has to be for a non-profit or charity or a particular type of organisation. Now, sometimes free software projects can uh, fall in within those rules and the lawyer will spend his percentage of his time on pro bono stuff working on free software uh, projects and helping out free software projects. So we've received help from pro bono lawyers a number of times from those you know, providing help within the guideline that some 10% or whatever of all their time is put into helping out the needy, right? And we're the needy ones that are asking for the help. But mostly we've got help from um, Evan Moglin. Evan Moglin was originally doing, he was a professor of law and still is a professor of law at Columbia University in the US a very well-respected law professor. And um, he just thought it was, a, it was his contribution to the free software movement. He thought it was a really good idea, the whole idea of free software. And he decided to, um, as a large part of his life, to provide assistance to free software projects, legal assistance. He's helped huge numbers of projects. Now, since then, he's created a whole legal practice. His whole legal practice is dedicated to helping free software projects. And they receive a lot of donations from large companies who are also interested in ensuring that free software continues to thrive. And those donations are sufficient for him to pay a whole team of lawyers 
to provide assistance to free software organisations. So it's becoming much more organised these days than it used to be in the past. It used to be you had to know some lawyer as a friend to get help, but now you can get help much more easily. Okay, so if all of this fails, you should always try and solve the problems amicably yourself and not involve the lawyers. And usually you can, in my experience, 90% of the time, uh, a few friendly emails, um, a few letters maybe, will solve any issues, right? And uh, when that fails, you can then contact something like the Software Freedom Law Centre and ask them, for them to help. And uh, they'll then give you some advice. They might advise on how you might write a better letter to convince them. Otherwise, they might write a letter on your behalf. Or if they're really unhelpful, then it might be that the Software Freedom Law Centre or some other group of lawyers actually goes and sues them. And that has happened a few times. And in each case, the free software lawyers have won. Uh, because they wouldn't take on the case unless they thought they were going to win. Uh, because losing could be very expensive. Uh, so, and there's a, if you're interested more about this, you could also look at gplviolations.org. And the, the person who maintains gplviolations.org, it's his mission in life to try to chase people up who are violating the GPL and to bring them back into compliance. And uh, so if you go and have a look at his site, you can see all the different examples of various companies trying to claim they didn't have to do these things under the GPL. And he carefully explains that yes, they do. And when they don't comply, he sues them. And then uh, they lose the court case. And then he says, OK, now you're going to have to comply. And they usually have to pay his costs and that type of thing. So it's, it's uh, really turned out rather well. But OK. One thing. Yeah. For example, I wrote a software. Yeah. And somebody violated it. And I came to know after one year that yep. somebody is using my software illegally. Yeah. So I wrote a letter and they were okay to stop all these things. Yeah. But during the one year they made money maybe billion dollars. Right. What about that money? You could try and claim that money, right? If it was a clear violation of your license. You need to seek legal advice, you need to go and talk to a lawyer. Um, you also have to decide, do you want to do it? Because it's likely to be a long and drawn out affair. If it involves lots of money, it will involve inevitably lots of lawyers. It will involve lots of costs on your behalf to chase it up. You have to make sure that you want to spend a good part of the next few years of your life chasing that money. Right? That's why the other company will say, okay, I stop it. And right. I decided don't, I'm not going to pursue this case. Right. But that company, again, pick up some software because right. they know that millions of money is involved. Yep. They again did the same thing and they start right. making money. Right. right. So you, you can try and chase up for past damages, um, but you need to seek real legal advice on that as to whether it's possible. Make sure that your license was very, very clear, that you that you made it clear in the documentation that it was under this particular license, etc. Um, so at this point, in principle, yes, you can go and claim that money. Uh, or you can try and get them to donate it somewhere, or you can try and you know shut them down or whatever. Lots of things you can potentially do but you would have to get a lawyer to help you with that. It's a, you, in theory, you can do it all by yourself. But in practice, the law is so complicated that trying to do it all yourself, you're unlikely to be successful. And you need to understand that even if a lawyer is doing it for you, it's still going to take a lot of your time, right? And so you have to make sure that it, you really want to spend the next few years of your life doing that. OK? Good. So this is some further reading. Rocklaw.net is an extremely good um, blog discussing law issues related to free software, legal issues of free software, very, very good, highly recommended. Um, PubPat.org is also an excellent site about patents, patent reform information, um, and there's a particularly good video on there from Dan Ravisher uh, giving a talk at, uh, as a Google technical talk. Uh, very, very good video. Uh, Softwarefreedom.org is the site for the um, Software Freedom Law Centre. That's the law firm that Evan Mogelman founded that is related to uh, defending free software. And again, a very good site. They put out a number of very good articles, uh, very detailed, considered articles on legal issues relating to free software. So if you want to know more about some particular issue, well worth looking on softwarefreedom.org and see what they've put out a paper on that particular issue. So that's it. So thank you very much. And we'll now we've got afternoon tea and then another lab, I believe. Hopefully there's a good... Uh